After more than four decades in orbit, the Voyager 2 spacecraft is one of the greatest testaments to human ingenuity because it is still operational under the most extreme conditions. This daring spacecraft, which is billions of kilometers from Earth, has never stopped sending back astounding and even alarming discoveries to the mission commanders here on the ground. When Voyager 2 left our solar system, it found a gigantic wall of fire. How does what occurs at this barrier influence us here on Earth? Come explore the wall of fire that Voyager 2 found at the solar system's frontier with us. The power source is what has allowed the Voyager 2 spacecraft to last as long as it has and stay in contact with Earth. The arrays of sensors and transmitters are important, but without the power source, they would have stopped sending back signals many years ago. The Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft aren't powered by solar energy, because that wouldn't work when they're so far from the Sun. Instead, each Voyager probe has three RTGs that are powered by plutonium-238. As the isotope breaks down, it releases heat that is turned into electricity. The Voyager started out producing 470 watts at 30 volts DC, but this has gone down over time. This isn't just because the fuel is running out. The thermocouples in the system also wore out over time. As of 2011, each Voyager was producing just under 270 watts, or about 76% of the power it had at the start of the mission. But the spacecraft has another power source that is also essential to its operation. They have small thrusters that let them turn around to face the Earth when needed for communication. And these thrusters draw fuel from a tank of hydrogen. Even though they only work for short periods, they will eventually run out. One interesting thing about thrusters is that they have a backup. After 37 years, the main thrusters stopped working well. So NASA switched to the backup thruster, which hadn't been used for almost 40 years. And they worked perfectly. Deep in a darkness of space where even the sun can't reach, Voyager 2 has reached a huge milestone in the exploration of space. It's the second spacecraft ever to go into interstellar space. This happened in 119 astronomical units from the Sun. As astronomical unit is the distance between the Sun and the Earth, which is 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers. The Voyager 1 had done these things years before the Voyager 2 because it had fewer detours. The formerly made flybys of Uranus and Neptune. But Voyager 2 was the first spacecraft to directly sample the electrically charged hazes and plasmas that fill interstellar space and the farthest edges of the solar system. Voyager 2 can look at solar winds, the composition and behavior of plasma particles, how cosmic rays interact, the structure and direction of magnetic fields, and other things that define the edges of the solar system. Even now, scientists still publish papers based on the data. Voyager 2 came back as it was leaving the solar system. Voyager 2's journey into interstellar space has taught us a lot about the edge of the solar system and shown us completely new things. Some of our ideas about the limits were also challenged by the event. To understand Voyager 2's latest findings correctly, you need to know how the sun works. The sun, in contrast to popular belief, is not a calmly burning ball of light, but rather a blazing nuclear furnace traveling through the galaxy at a speed of roughly 450,000 miles per hour. As the sun moves around the center of the galaxy, you might not feel it moving fast because the solar system is so big. However, the sun is a constant source of magnetic fields, so its surface is always giving off a breeze of electrically charged particles called the solar wind. This wind blows in all directions and carries the magnetic field of the sun with it. At some point, the solar wind will run into the interstellar medium, which is made up of old debris from explosions and other stars. The solar wind and the medium between the stars don't mix well, as well as oil and water. This causes the solar wind to make a bubble in the space between the stars. This bubble is called a heliosphere. Two space travelers have written down that the leading edge of this bubble is about 11 billion miles from the sun. It wraps around the sun, all eight planets, and most of the objects in space that are furthest from our star. Note though that the heliosphere acts as a shield. It protects everything inside it from most of the galaxy's high energy radiation. And without it, your DNA would have been changed. But the heliosphere ends at a point called heliopause, which is where interstellar space starts. Now, what does this line look like? Knowing this can help us picture how our sun moves through the galaxy. 
and it can also tell us more about what is going on with other stars all over the universe. Why scientists were excited as Voyager 2 got close to the edge. But keep in mind that some of Voyager 1's instruments stopped working before it crossed the boundary, so there's no way to follow its path during that time. But when Voyager 2 crossed the heliopause, scientists could see for the first time what happens to an object when it gets within 140 million miles of the heliopause. They found that the plasma around the spaceship slowed down, got hotter, and became denser. But once it crossed the boundary, the interstellar medium got about 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than scientists could have ever imagined. If you're wondering how Voyager 2 could have survived the heat, it's because the plasma is very thin and spread out which kept the average temperature around the Voyager probes very low. Voyager 2 also proved the theory that the heliopause is like a leaky border. These leaks actually go both ways. Before Voyager 1 went through the heliopause, it sped through tendrils of interstellar particles that had punched through the heliopause like tree roots through rock. But when it came to Voyager 2, the spacecraft went through a slow stream of low-energy particles that went more than 100 million miles past the heliopause. As Voyager 1 got within 800 million miles of the heliopause, it entered an area where the outgoing solar wind slowed to a crawl. This was another mystery. Before it crossed the heliopause, Voyager 2 saw the solar wind from a different layer that was almost as wide as the one that Voyager 1 saw. For as long as Voyager has been around, we have known that the sun's influence reaches well beyond our own solar system. Coronal mass injections CMEs, are shock waves of plasma that regularly erupt from the sun. They actively contribute to molding the remainder of the solar system. Data from the Voyager 2 showed, however, how CMEs can spread beyond the heliopause and reduce a number of cosmic rays outside the bubble. This is comparable to what you may discover in the galaxy, where supernovae has also sent shock waves out into the galaxy, churning the interstellar medium, albeit not as violently as CMEs. A shockwave from a supernova in the interstellar medium could spark the development of the solar system and beyond. While it is true that cosmic rays may have a positive effect on biological mutations on Earth, Voyager 2 shows that the Sun may potentially play a role in the possible evolution of life on alien worlds, interplanetary system, and beyond. Interplanetary puzzle solving demands an improved heliosphere vista. Both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 left the heliosphere in different locations. Voyager 1 along the leading edge, where the heliosphere collides with the interstellar medium, and Voyager 2 along the left flank. There is currently insufficient information to determine the general form of the heliospheric wake. There's no telling if the pressure of the interstellar medium keeps the heliosphere about spherical, if it has a tail like a comet, or if it's more of a croissant form. There are other ships in space besides explorers. Unfortunately, given they are also leaving the solar system, even when they reach the heliosphere, they will never be able to send back any information. Three radioisotope thermoelectric generators, RTGs, were installed on the ends of each rover's booms courtesy of NASA. These are among the simplest nuclear power options. In this design, a radioactive brick is surrounded by thermocouples, which generate electricity by exploiting the temperature difference between the brick and the surrounding cold area. The reactor cores RTGs, on Voyager 1 and 2 use plutonium-238, an isotope of plutonium that decays only into alpha particles, which are safely absorbed by the RTG and don't affect the rest of the spacecraft's electronics. The decay of the plutonium over time reduces the power output, and the cooling of the brick reduces the efficiency of the thermoelectric generator. Considering that plutonium-338 has a half-life of 87.7 years, the spacecraft's power supply would be reduced by 0.787% annually. However, the actual electrical power available has dropped, somewhat faster than that due to the decreasing efficiency of the thermocouples and the progressive degradation of various electrical components in the spacecraft. After 23 years in space, the spacecraft's power supplies only produce 67% of their original output by the end of the year 2000. On April 24, 1979, the first pictures of Jupiter from Voyager 2 started coming back. These pictures showed how the atmosphere moved over time. On its way into the system, Voyager 2 went close to Jupiter's moons, unlike Voyager 1. Scientists were especially interested in learning more about Europa and Law. Voyager had already looked at Callisto, Ganymede, Europa Law, and Amalthea. But Voyager 2 was able to get closer. 
This close encounter gave Voyager 2 amazing photos of the whole system, including Jupiter's moons. In fact, Voyager 2 came within 127,830 miles or 205,720 kilometers of Europa. At its closest point to Jupiter, Voyager 2 was about 400,785 miles or 645,000 kilometers away. Remember the Pioneer spacecraft? It sent back new information about the planet's clouds, its newly found four moons and ring system, and 17,000 new pictures. They had also flown by Jupiter, but the atmosphere didn't change much from one time to the next. Voyager 2, on the other hand, saw a lot of big changes like the great red spot moving and changing shape and color. With the two Voyager's cameras working together, we've been able to make maps of at least 80% of Ganymede and Callisto's surfaces with a resolution of about 3 miles or 5 kilometers. Two hours after getting as close as it could to Jupiter, Voyager 2 changed its course and sped towards Saturn, a plan made in January 1981 to send a spacecraft to Uranus Neptune later in the decade set the spacecraft on its new path. In August 1981, Voyager 2 met the sixth planet, Saturn, two years after it left Jupiter's system. It started by taking pictures of the moon Lapidus, and it did the same photo mission as its predecessor, even though it was 14,219 miles or 23,000 kilometers closer to Saturn. In August of 1981, when it was about 63,000 miles or 101,000 kilometers away, this planet came the closest. Voyager 1 had already found the ring spokes and kinks, the F ring and its shepherding moons. The spacecraft would take better pictures of these features. Based on what Voyager 2 found, Saturn's A ring might be only 980 feet or 300 meters thick. As it flew behind and above Saturn, the probe went through the plane of Saturn's rings at a speed of 8 miles per second, or 13 kilometers per second. During this time, the spacecraft was hit by thousands of tiny dust particles that turned into puffs of plasma when they were vaporized. This caused the spacecraft's orientation to change many times, and its attitude control jets fired many times to keep it stable. Even though the encounter was scary, Voyager 2 was able to take pictures of Saturn's moons. At this point, Voyager 2 had already met its main mission goals, but the mission planners didn't want to let the spacecraft go. Instead, they sent the Finnish spacecraft to Uranus, which would take about four and a half years to reach. In fact, its encounter with Jupiter was partly planned to make sure that future flybys of other planets could happen. Even the way Uranus meets Neptune was made so that Neptune could meet Uranus in the future. But at this point, Voyager 2 started to make its own history. For example, it was the first human-made object to fly by the planet Uranus. At this point, signals from the spacecraft took about two and a half hours to reach Earth. This was because the signal was traveling at the speed of light, and the amount of light in space was 400 times less than on Earth. The closest Voyager 2 got to Uranus was in January 1986, when it was about 50,640 miles or 81,500 kilometers away. During its flyby, it found 10 new moons inspired by Shakespeare. They were given names like Puck, Portia, Juliet, Cressida, Rosalind, Belinda, Desimona, Cordelia, Ophelia, and Blanca. In addition to the nine rings that were already found, Voyager 2 found two more rings in a magnetic field that was 55 degrees off axis and off center. The spacecraft found that Uranus has strong winds that move about 450 miles per hour or 725 kilometers per hour. It also found evidence of a boiling ocean water about 497 miles or 800 kilometers below the top cloud. Miranda, Oberon, Ariel, Umbriel, and Titania, which are all moods of Uranus, were also photographed in amazing ways by Voyager 2. After visiting Uranus, the spacecraft went to Neptune, which is about 4.3 billion miles or 7 billion kilometers away from Earth. Voyager 2 flew about 2,918 miles or 4,800 kilometers over the giant planet's cloud tops. It was the first man-made object to do so. It found Proteus, Larissa, Despina, Galatea, Talassa, and Naiad, which are all new moons. Voyager also took pictures of two-thirds of Neptune's largest moon, Triton, which showed that it is the coldest known planet in the solar system and has an ice volcano made of nitrogen on its surface. The flyby of Neptune was the last time Voyager 2 saw a planet during its 12 years in deep space. 
Almost all of the goals on the original grand tour of the solar system plan have been met. Once past the system of Neptune, Voyager 2 took a path below the ecliptic plane and out of the solar system about 35 million miles or 56 million kilometers after the encounter. To save power, the instruments on Voyager 2 were put in a low power mode. NASA officially renamed the whole project the Voyager Interstellar Mission, or VIM, after the encounter with Neptune. Of the four spacecraft that were sent out of the solar system in the 1970s, three of them, Voyager 1, 2, and Pioneer 11, were heading in the same direction, towards the Sun's center. This meant that they were going in the direction that the Sun seemed to be moving in the Milky Way galaxy. As a result, they were likely to reach the heliopause before Pioneer 10, which was headed toward the heliosphere stale. In order to save more energy, NASA turned off the non-essential instruments for good in November 1998. Only seven instruments were still working. At the turn of the century, this was 21 years after the ship was first launched. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, continued to get ultraviolet and particle fields data shows. For example, that huge shock wave that came from the outer heliosphere in July 2000 and finally reached Voyager 2 in January 2001. During a six-month trip, the shock wave had driven through the solar wind, picking up charged particles and speeding them up. Voyager 2 sent back important information about the high-energy shock energized ion. In August of 2007, Voyager 2 went through the termination shock and then went into the helio sheath. By November 2017, the spacecraft was 116.167 AU, which is about 10.8 billion miles or 17.378 billion kilometers from Earth, and moving at 9.6 miles per second or 15.4 kilometers per second relative to the Sun. It was moving towards the Constellation Telescopium. Voyager 2 crossed the heliopause on November 5, 2018. This is the boundary where the effects of the solar wind stop. From then on, Voyager 2 was in what is called space or the interstellar medium. Voyager 1 had crossed it years before, but there were some disagreements about it. At this point, Voyager 2's plasma instrument saw the jump in particle density as protons, electrons, and other charged particles hit the instrument. It also wrote down the temperature, which was between 30,000 and 50,000 Kelvin. On July 8, 2019, Voyager 2's thrusters for correcting its course were successfully turned on. These thrusters will be used to control where the spacecraft points for the foreseeable future. In 1989, when Voyager 2 went by Neptune, that was the last time those thrusters were used. The spacecraft's antenna has drifted away from Earth because its aging attitude control thrusters have been degrading and need to fire an ever-increasing amount of pulses to maintain its Earthward orientation. In January of 2018, Voyager 1 also began using its tack correction thrusters for the same purpose. Engineers had to create a new plan to control both antique robots to ensure they continue to return the highest quality scientific data from the outer reaches of space. This plan forced them to make some tough decisions, such as which equipment to retain operational and which thrusters to use. Voyager 2 is still functioning despite being so far away from Earth that it takes over 17 hours for a signal to reach us. So what are your thoughts on the ongoing Voyager mission? Let us know in the comments section. And if you've enjoyed this video and would like to see more, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you'll be notified whenever we upload a new content. That's it for today, and I'll see you in the next video.